Summers, who's making his way back towards the front. And I will simply hold this place until he gets here and or people sit down. And for those of you online, sorry for the delay, but it's worth it. So. So Larry, do you want to introduce Alan Auerbach by saying his name, Alan Auerbach? We're now going to move from discussing monetary policy to fiscal policy. And Alan Auerbach will present the paper. And then we have a distinguished group of panelists who will speak about the paper. <laughs> Alan. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I am speaking without slides, as you can see. Uh, the, uh, primarily because um, I, I don't have any uh, pretty graphs or uh, anything like that in my paper, and I thought I'd, that putting, putting words up there and then repeating the words wouldn't be that helpful. Um, but I will tell you, just uh, for those who haven't had a chance to look at the paper, that I, I um, uh, cover four uh, topics, uh, broad topics in the paper. Uh, budget rules and their role, uh, in, uh, in fiscal policy, uh, st well, uh, evolution of thinking about stabilization policy, the question of fiscal policy with uh, low interest rates, which uh, Larry and Olivier uh, talked about uh, in their presentation, and coordination of monetary and fiscal policy, which has also come up a little bit. I spend the most time on the first two topics, and we'll probably do that uh, right now as well. Um, in an in a environment where we're, uh, a lot of people are, uh, uh, come from the orientation of monetary policy, we're, of course, familiar with the debate of rules versus discretion, and that got a lot of uh, uh, play in, in Ben's uh, discussion and discussion of his paper th this morning. Um, but we have fiscal rules as well, and we've, we've tried various uh, 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 versions of that in the U.S., uh, we've had an evolution uh, uh, in the Euro European Monetary Union, uh, going back to the Stability and Growth Pact, of trying to uh, come up with fiscal rules uh, that, in some sense, uh, constrain governments from doing bad things, uh, fiscally irresponsible things, while at the same time allowing f a flexible conduct of uh, fiscal policy. Um, and the rules, uh, not so much in the U.S., where we, we basically... Uh, don't have any rules or don't have uh, any effective rules anymore, but I would say in Europe, uh, the rules have gotten more and more complicated. Um, and I actually looked at the most recent version. Um, but the question is whether complicating, complicating rules makes them uh, more effective, even if it makes them more flexible. And uh, I think the answer is no. Um, I think we do have evidence that what one, some people who are, who are cynical or skeptical about rules sometimes wonder whether fiscal rules uh, can, can really have any effect, whether governments simply can get around them. Um, we certainly have anecdotal evidence that they do. But nevertheless, I think we have also have illustrations where they have an effect. But I think where they have an effect, these effects are often negative. Um, uh, uh, hindering the uh, needed actions by governments um, for example, leading to pro-cyclical fiscal policy when that's not something that w w one would want. And I think that ultimately making rules more complex essentially makes them more opaque. Uh, and, 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 and that effect means makes them subjective and that it makes them op optional. And, um, and I also think uh, in terms of going forward, if we're thinking about what's different in the future, uh, the, the budget, and this also relates to my point about fiscal policy with low interest rates, the, the budget stress and the budget problems that the governments of developed countries face now relate much more to uh, implicit liabilities than they do to explicit ones. There are some countries where this is a, there are exceptions, but certainly it's true for the United States. 
Uh, if you just look at the uh, unfunded liabilities of the Medicare and Social Security systems, as reported by the trustees' uh, reports that came out in July, uh, they are roughly six times the size of publicly held national debt in the United States. Uh, now, we don't have exactly comparable estimates for all countries, but we know that these are, uh, this is not a problem unique to the United States. Uh, leaving aside the issue of dealing, you know, what, what policies we should undertake to deal with these uh, uh, very large commitments, trying to deal, have fiscal rules that don't take them into account seems like you're starting pretty far behind. Uh, now, uh, there has been a, a movement toward trying to take account of these liabilities, trying to measure them. We do that I, through, the, through the trustees' reports that I just mentioned in the U.S. Uh, there's a, uh, the European Commission puts out a triannual um, aging report, uh, which uh, does similar kinds of calculations uh, for pension uh, commitments and looking at the effects of, of pension reforms in Europe. Uh, I think these are very important uh, uh, initiatives, and, and I think we should be doing more of them. And I think that uh, falls in line with another direction of, in which progress, I think, could be made, um, which is the development and strengthening of uh, independent or quasi-independent fiscal entities uh, uh, at the national level in different countries. Now, what I'm not thinking here, I think one can only carry the analogy to independent central banks a certain distance. You can't have, you can't delegate authority for making fiscal policy to uh, an independent fiscal authority. <laughs> fiscal policy decisions are, are much more complex. I mean, monetary policy decisions have gotten more complex in the last 10 years as well. But if you think about the dimensions of fiscal policy, there are many more that, uh, uh, decisions that have to be made. And you, you can't simply, for example, give a deficit target to a fiscal authority and, and tell them to make fiscal policy. That's just not, a, not uh, even worth thinking about. But that doesn't mean that you can't have uh, uh, independent fiscal entities that have bite. I mean, if, and if you say, well, can fiscal entities have an impact? Uh, Ask yourself what impact the Congressional Budget Office had this summer in the U.S. Uh, in the health care uh, de debate in uh, Congress, uh, or what effect the Joint Committee on Taxation is going to have uh, in the upcoming discussion of tax, uh, of proposed tax reform. Uh, these are not really independent organizations. Other countries, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility in the U.K., which uh, does its own uh, macroeconomic projections, which the government has to use in uh, in, in uh, putting its policies together. Uh, well, there are various models of so-called fiscal councils that uh, one can think of. And uh, I think that is in the, in the spirit of providing information uh, to, to not only to inform uh, citizens and voters, but also to provide uh, dis a certain amount of discipline uh, to governments uh, in the decisions they make. And I think the, the, the problems, we, we've, I think we have learned from uh, our failures that, the, that uh, you can't really design fiscal rules to get things right uh, if you insist that they be rules as opposed to guidelines. Uh, let, me, uh, let me turn to uh, stabilization policy. Uh, the last decade, is, uh, especially, has, has, uh, we've experienced a rebirth of, uh, of the use of discretionary fiscal policy. So if you go back a little bit earlier than that, we had this uh, division of uh, labor between monetary and fiscal policy, and the role of fiscal policy in terms of stabilization was to provide automatic stabilizers, and monetary policy was going to, supposed to carry a lot of the weight. And of course, uh, not only because of the uh, zero lower bound, uh, but also because of the, uh, the depth of the, uh, of the recessions around the world, uh, we've come to rely more on, on uh, stabilization policy. Uh, indeed, uh, we probably didn't rely on, on fiscal policy enough uh, during, the, during this period. Uh, certainly, people, many people thought that at the time, and in retrospect, looking at economic performance uh, during the period, uh, one can certainly th uh, see that uh, stronger fiscal stimulus would probably have been a good idea. I think uh, going along with this use, uh, 
I think uh, Ben said talked this morning about Q, uh, QE uh, working in practice and wondering whether it works in theory. I think uh, this is a little bit true of fiscal policy too, that we adopted fiscal policy uh, believing that multipliers would be significant, um, but we didn't really have models that suggested that to be true, at least not, not recent models. Uh, there's uh, subsequently been uh, research, uh, in my view, validating uh, the beliefs that particularly in periods of economic slack, uh, fiscal policy can be pretty strong uh, in terms of uh, helping the economy. Uh, one of the interesting things about this development uh, is that uh, the automatic stabilizers, and this was already mentioned, I think Olivier mentioned this this morning, automatic stabilizers have receded. Uh, and, and we've gone from thinking that they, they should be, that should be mostly what fiscal policy is doing uh, at, at high frequencies, and we don't really think, we haven't really been talking about it very much, and we probably should. And I agree that um, uh, thinking a little bit harder about uh, the uh, high frequency responses of fiscal policy that happen automatically and not just relying on uh, tax structures that are adopted for entirely other reasons uh, to, uh, to deliver the right kind of uh, automatic uh, response. Now, let me cast a, um, a little bit of cold water on the idea of making uh, shovel-ready shovel projects more shovel-ready. This was, you know, there, there was a, a feeling, uh, a, you know, at the beginning of a financial crisis in the U.S. that if we only had uh, a better list of shovel-ready projects, we could, uh, we could have uh, done better. Uh, and uh, with, with the, uh, the uh, uh, implementing the uh, spending uh, for, for, as a result of legislation in 2009. I just don't think it's, it's feasible to do that with capital uh, spending projects. Uh, capital spending projects, to the extent that you're thinking of projects that uh, you know, require a lot of engineering and planning, uh, and which, for which the, the plans would change over time as technology changes and the value of different resources, uh, uh, having different public resources changes, those aren't the kinds of things you want to keep lists of uh, for the you know, next recession, which might start in five years. If you have a public project that's really worth investing in, you don't necessarily want to put that on the list to wait for the next recession. Um, and if you wait for the next recession, you may find that you're dealing with something like driverless cars that you hadn't been anticipating when you uh, designed the, uh, the, uh, the public project. So I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that that's the kind of uh, uh, increase in automatic response that we'd want. I think we're likely to uh, uh, want to gravitate more toward uh, uh, policies that automatically increase transfer payments. Uh, either we and we had some of that in the 2009 uh, legislation, um, as well as policies that automatically uh, give money to the states, because if in our in, in the in the recession that we had. One of the biggest drags on economic activity was the large uh, cutbacks in spending uh, uh, that many states uh, had to, uh, had to uh, adopt very early in the recession as a result of uh, de degradation of their budget position. Just um, uh, a couple, a few words each on fiscal policy with low interest rates and the, uh, the coordination um, between uh, fiscal and, and monetary policy. I am not as uh, excited uh, about undertaking uh, vast uh, expansions of government activity uh, because of low interest rates, as Olivier and, and Larry seem to be. Was this one of the points you didn't agree on or one of the points you agreed on? You, agree, you agreed on this one. OK. So now I'll establish the disagreement then. Um, the, um, uh, a few reasons for this. Uh, first is the, the reason I already mentioned. Uh, if we think, and I'll use the U.S. as a template, but again, it's not, it's not unique to the U.S. If we think of where our budget problems lie in the U.S., they don't lie in our 80% publicly held debt to GDP ratio. They lie in the very, very large uh, implicit liabilities we have uh, for programs that are not sustainable and which would imply very large primary deficits, growing primary deficits in the future. Low interest rates don't help with future liabilities. Ask a, uh, 
a state or local government official that ha with an unfunded pension plan, uh, whether they think it would be a good idea for them to assume a lower rate of return um, uh, in their actuarial calculations. The, the same issue or the same problem arises at the uh, national level as we think about our unfunded liabilities. That is not to say that debt would grow more slowly uh, if, if, the debt, if the debt service load is lower. It's just saying that that's dealing with one aspect of the problem. It's not dealing at all with the problems we face in the future. Now, you might say that gives you more time to respond to the problems you face in the future. That may or may not be true, uh, but that's different than uh, a green light. Um, second, uh, and I think this relates to the question of permanence of interest rate below growth rate. Um, we, live in, we live in uncertain times. And saying that uh, we expect over, the, over a certain uh, um, uh, horizon uh, the interest rate to be low doesn't mean that we know that the interest rate will be below the growth rate. And if we think about the, uh, the states of the world <clears throat> in which that's not true, for example, where we have very negative growth, um, and so our budget GDP, uh, debt to GDP ratio worsens. Uh, those, are, those are periods when we might feel more budget stressed and where we also uh, will value resources more highly, uh, which suggests incorporating a certain amount of risk aversion in the interest rate that we use in our uh, calculations. Um, finally, uh, the argument that, um, you know, Borrowing to invest in infrastructure or some other uh, potentially useful government uh, function um, has the additional benefit of supplying more safe assets that because there's such a scarcity of them, they, they're, they're, uh, they're a real bargain for issuers. I think is an argument for issuing safe assets. It's not an argument, argument for expanding government activity. Uh, well, you, might, you might say, well what, well, what can you do with the money? Well, you can you know, invest it in private securities. If, uh, if the Fed can do it, the Treasury can do it too, I guess. And, um, uh, and that suggests that we should decouple the decision about uh, expanding the supply of safe assets, at least within a certain range. Obviously, it, at some point, it becomes difficult to imagine uh, the, the Treasury taking positions in, uh, at, a, uh, at a large scale in private asset markets. Um, not, none of this is to say that we shouldn't be investing more in infrastructure. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that uh, our, our level of infrastructure spending uh, over the, uh, in recent decades has fallen to, to uh, alarmingly low levels and that we've been allocating resources in the wrong places. Um, but that, that's a, that's a, to me, that's an entirely different argument. That's saying, that, that's saying what, the allocate, what the government budget should look like, uh, not necessarily how big the government budget should be. Um, and finally, on the coordination of, uh, and I'll end with a couple of comments here, uh, on the coordination of uh, monetary and fiscal policy, uh, you know, I think more about fiscal policy than monetary policy, but, but occasionally when I have to teach undergraduate macro or something like that, I'm always a little bit uncomfortable when I have to explain what monetary policy is and what fiscal policy is because they're sort of related. And they're you know, the very simple act of an open market operation is, you know, is essentially fiscal policy because this, the seniorage goes, is, is, uh, goes back to the Treasury. Um, so in, in at least in some very fundamental sense, except you're, unless you're really dropping uh, currency out of, an air, out of a helicopter, uh, monetary and fiscal policy are not independent. Uh, that's become much more obvious uh, and I think even at, at the undergraduate level become much more obvious in the last decade since as you expand central bank balance sheets and go beyond government securities to, uh, to private securities, uh, well, the, the central bank is essentially doing a, a fiscal policy operation. It's, it's, a, it's an operation that's equivalent to the, uh, the Treasury or the, or the Finance Ministry uh, issuing government securities and using the funds to invest in private securities. We would certainly think of that as fiscal policy uh, if it were done that way. Uh, and indeed, if one wants to think about the effects of quantitative easing, you'd want to think about what the, what the, uh, what the uh, Treasury or the Finance Ministry is doing at the same time. 
Um, the, I'm, I am uh, not particularly sympathetic to uh, criticisms of uh, the Fed, uh, of the ECB, uh, uh, and other central banks for their aggressive uh, actions during the financial crisis, uh, given that there was a inadequate fiscal policy uh, uh, activity at the same time. If you've got a, if you've got a crisis and, uh, you know, if the house is on fire and the, and the other person isn't using his hose, you, you know, using, using the one you have seems like a good idea. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, the fiscal policy has faced different constraints in different countries. In the U.S., I think it was more of a political constraint. Europe, it's, it's a much more fundamental one. This already came up. There is no potential for fiscal policy, or not really coordinated fiscal policy, uh, in the same way there is in a, in, a, in a nation like the U.S. that has a large central government. Um, as I think forward, um, if you think about the overlap and conflicts between monetary and fiscal policy, I tend to think of the problem as, as not being one of, of too much overlap and infringement on, on the other's turf, as there being uh, actually weakness on both sides. So if one thinks to, ahead to the next recession and you've got go, uh, governments that have elevated debt to GDP ratio and debt, debt, debt to GDP ratios and uh, looming implicit liabilities uh, that both politically and possibly economically limit their ability to undertake fiscal policy and at the same time having central banks still facing the zero lower bound, I don't think we should be worrying so much about uh, the uh, fiscal and monetary authorities stepping on each other's toes is we should be worrying about where the stimulus is going to come from, um, and as both of them will be undercut. Um, and on, on that, um, since this is a discussion about fiscal policy, I think fiscal policy faces an additional challenge, uh, which is that uh, the, the, the issue of inequality came up already once today, and I know it's going to come up tomorrow in Jason's paper. Uh, we have a, 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 a problem that we have to deal with, uh, which, which is growing inequality. Uh, at least, it's, it's not, to be clear, it's not a worldwide problem in the sense that it, of increasing inequality uh, on, a, on a worldwide basis. But certainly within developed countries, it's a problem. Um, and that really, in itself, uh, calls for more active and, and expanded fiscal policy. And that puts pr pressure on the budget. And at the same time that that pressure is being put on the budget to basically use transfers and use government spending to address some of the problems of inequality, I think the uh, ability of governments to raise money is probably going to be going down because of factor mobility, because of, of, of skill, the mobility of skilled labor and especially the mobility of capital and the mobility of profits. Um, we're seeing this in what's happening to corporate tax rates around the world. Uh, which have been steadily going down, except in the United States. Um, and it, it, it presents a challenge to the U.S. and other countries uh, in terms of trying to come up with better uh, fiscal, po uh, fiscal tax systems and improvements uh, in, in tax systems that allow them uh, to maintain a, a, a steady supply of, uh, of revenue uh, for the uh, various needs that they have. Uh, but I think that problem makes uh, that, you know, having... A greater difficulty of raising money and at the same time having higher demands on the funds because of inequality uh, makes the challenge of, of, of providing enough fiscal space uh, for, the, for dealing with the next uh, crisis uh, more difficult. Thanks. because uh, Alan did not have any slides while I do as a discussant. Uh, so if you uh, forgive me. Now, if I could operate them somehow. Uh, you think I would go yeah, there? Yes. 
Ya, oke. Okay. Go ahead with it. And, oke, okay, I don't see them. Now the... Okay, if someone can help, uh, we here we are. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much uh, for the for the invitation, uh, and um, it is uh, great to be here. I think I uh, actually provided uh, some comments already uh, two years ago in the previous um, the previous uh, um, vintage of this uh, conference and uh, and book. Um, now. Uh, and it's great to to comment the paper, uh, very easy paper by uh, by Alan actually. So um, here is the plan. It's not the plan. Okay. There are some. I have some uh, difficulties. Uh, okay. Come to the rescue. How do I operate this? Okay. Press down there. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. So this is the this is the plan. So the there's some key changes in the fiscal architecture since the uh, since the crisis. Alan uh, uh, made several um, pertinent comments in the uh, in his uh, in his paper on that and also uh, orally now. I think what what is still missing to ensure a viable uh, fiscal framework for the for the euro area and finally some concluding remarks. Um, on the, the um, first point. Um, I think what was the conventional view of fiscal policy when the, basically the Maastricht Treaty and the uh, um, Stability pa Pact was conceived? We are talking here about 92, the Maastricht Treaty, 97, uh, uh, end of the 90s for the Stability Pact. The conventional view, at least in Europe, I'm not saying that this uh, was you know, widely uh, uh, shared, but certainly in Europe, is that... Uh, um, uh, rules were there to tame, de uh, to tame deficit bias in uh, uh, monetary union in absence of, the, uh, of a change rate policy. I think there was a favorable view on the working of automatic stabilizers. I think with the qualifications that uh, I think uh, Olivier mentioned this several times that uh, the automatic stabilizers uh, are there uh, essentially for, if one takes a Musgrevian perspective for uh, uh, insurance, uh, so allocative purposes and redistribution, not for stabilization. So not necessarily you get the right, uh, the right stance, uh, uh, stabilization uh, out of that. But they were seen as operating without uh, uh, without delay. And um, I think the Sargent and Wallace monetary arithmetic was what dominated at the time. So the fear was to have risk of debt monetization. Uh, uh, dominating um, the, f the monetary fiscal uh, relations, uh, also uh, low spillovers uh, because of uh, um, offsetting monetary policy reaction. So basically, you can f you can focus on countries, uh, no need to take into account uh, a area-wide uh, consideration. So the, con the out of all this negative coordination was considered to be enough. So impose rules to. Uh, to tame misbehavior, uh, and that would be that would be enough. So that was the uh, the gist of the consensus at the time. Fast forward to today, uh, after the crisis, I think there has been clearly an evolution also uh, in uh, in Europe on, with uh, the role of discretionary policy seen important in case of large uh, uh, shocks. If you face risk of secular stagnation. I think the high uh, multipliers uh, in the case of zero lower bound. I think the similar work by Olivier uh, here uh, is, uh, uh, has affected the debate very, uh, very much. And the, for the uh, euro area as a whole, the aggregate fiscal stance uh, as an important uh, concept. And here the issue is the distribution of the fiscal stance amongst the, the participants. Uh, the shock was a massive one, and uh, it has exposed the sovereign bank nexus. Uh, so um, uh, Alan talked about the differentiation, uh, sometimes uh, tenuous, uh, between uh, monetary and fiscal policies. Uh, if you look at financial policies, the distinction is even, even more uh, uh, blurred. Um, if you move to an institutional and political economy perspective, I think the issue of the links between fiscal policy and incentives for structural reforms has come to the fore um, very prominently. Um, 
in all this, uh, in the triangle between uh, rules, institutions, and market discipline, uh, things have been, uh, let's say, reconsidered. Uh, uh, and the whole emphasis essentially on fiscal rules has been considered to be, to be uh, excessive. Underlying this is my final bullet here, is the difficult to sanction you know, financially sovereign states. So with uh, all the goodwill that one can have, uh, difficult uh, at the end of the day to impose, uh, uh, to impose sanctions. Now, um, what, is, what has been the uh, evolution of the uh, framework that we have uh, um, since uh, uh, 20, uh, 2011? If you look at the com uh, elements pertaining to the conventional view of, uh, of, fiscal, uh, of fiscal policy, uh, stronger role, stronger uh, stability and growth pact, accent on national fiscal framework here, uh, I think very prominent in Alan's paper and his presentation here. I mean, the fiscal council being part of uh, uh, more solid national fiscal frameworks. So the issue here of uh, not only checking from Brussels at the central level, but also uh, empowering uh, institutions at the national level and macro surveillance, so going uh, from exclusive attention and focus on fiscal policy to macroeconomic policy imbalances and so on and so forth. If you move to the, what I've called here, the revised role of fiscal policy on EMU post-crisis, uh, the establishment of the uh, European stability mechanism uh, to help in case of liquidity crisis. I think more flexibility in applying uh, the rules with various, various clauses, some to safeguard and boost investment and structural uh, reforms. I think the concept of a euro area fiscal stance also come in prominently to the fore. And finally, on the breaking the sovereign bank nexus, uh, the chantier still uh, uh, open on banking union and capital and capital markets union. Now, if you move to, from those reforms to what is uh, still uh, um, remaining in terms of vulnerabilities, um, I mentioned banking union non, uh, uh, not completed uh, yet, and the still high uh, exposure of national financial sector to sovereigns. Um, I think we have the... Um, we have to acknowledge the limits of the application of rules uh, and peer pressures on elected governments. Uh, I mentioned it uh, uh, before. And um, whether the EMU has the capacity to withstand uh, you know, a next large shock um, question mark here. I mean, the ESM is there. I think is, uh, it works uh, 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 properly, but is still dependent on national treasuries and the slow decision uh, decision making. We are going to come forward with some proposals to streamline that uh, in uh, in December. And there is no tool for smoothing asymmetric shocks and managing the euro area fiscal stance when uh, uh, when needed. Um, we have not been able effectively to achieve an appropriate fiscal stance with the right distribution of fiscal effort. I mean, we have now a broadly neutral fiscal stance. I think if you take the cycle, the position of the cycle, that is probably by and large okay, but the distribution actually is the wrong uh, one. Basically, countries without fiscal space, uh, they would like to spend more. Those who have fiscal space, they don't want, like, they don't want to use it. And I think uh, what we have learned uh, Probably since uh, Dexter White Keynes uh, the discussion of Bretton Woods is that uh, constraining creditors is uh, almost impossible. Uh. So here we have um, we have then a situation in which uh, uh, too much of the euro area uh, sustaining the euro area falls on the shoulders of the uh, ECB, and the missing piece is a minimum fiscal capacity to secure macroeconomic financial stability, so to act uh, at the center. So looking forward, what is, um, let's say, a design of uh, uh, a fiscal framework that works uh, in, uh, in Europe? I have to summarize this in this triangle uh, uh, here. We uh, started basically with extreme simplicity, 3, uh, so the 3.0, the 3% 3 rule of the of massive treaty, and we moved towards more adaptability, smartness. Uh, um, and here, um, in that, the rules have become more and more complex. Now, I think I would like to make a point here, which I think is a fundamental one. Uh, 
the complexity of the rules is not a cause for not application of the rules. The complexity of the rules uh, is the effect of the lack of trust between players, which leads to the attempt to write the complete contract. Uh, in trying to spell out all the different uh, rules and the different algorithms, because when you move to ad adaptability, we have moved the attention from headline deficit to, to structural deficit, and then uh, how do you calculate the output gap, how do you calculate the semi-elasticity, and, uh, and if you want to, uh, to spell out everything in detail, then you attempt to write the complete contract, and the 264 pages of the Vademecum that uh, Alan mentioned in the uh, in the paper is, uh, is, uh, is the result. So now the orientation is to move so, some, towards something that is more predictable uh, and inevitably somewhat uh, less uh, intelligent. Final uh, point on the, the way forward. So the element, the right balance here. I think we have to move to a better balance between centralization and decentralization. Uh, more simplified uh, uh, fiscal rules. I think we need a common fiscal capacity, last resort backstop for the banking union, uh, reinforced ability to intervene in case of gross uh, uh, errors. And then in decentralization, Alan um, uh, stresses that empowered independent uh, fiscal institutions, they, they have had an impact on the behavior of government, especially on the issue of, on the, uh, let's say, plausibility of macroeconomic uh, 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 forecast. Um, um, I think more binding rules uh, uh, for the medium uh, for the medium term and reinforce market discipline. I think here this is a, it's a very delicate uh, issue, obviously. So the con my conclusions on this: uh, the crisis has revealed fault lines in the original EMU uh, design. I think we have uh, vulnerabilities uh, in the kind that have led. The e too much burden on the shoulders on the ECB. I think we had to find the right balance between rules, institutions, and market uh, discipline. And on this, I think the reforms will have to pass not only, that's what we always look at in, in Europe, the political viability test, but also the economic and uh, the uh, market stability test. Uh, here, sequencing in right in particular, if we want to increase uh, market, uh, uh, market discipline. Um, uh, we are going to come forward with, with proposals uh, in, uh, in December, which would uh, try to articulate in a, in a better way the, the, the relations between institutions, rules, uh, and markets uh, in the pursuit of fiscal um, prudence. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Valerie Ray. Uh, thank you very much for having me join the panel. Um, I'm going to talk about Alan's paper, although I will also talk about several wider aspects of fiscal policy. Uh, just to overview, Alan talks about four very important issues in fiscal policy. The first is fiscal rules, the practicality, the idea uh, whether one gains from rules versus discretion. The second is the potential for stabilization policy. Third is fiscal policy in a low interest rate environment. And the fourth is, uh, boy, I can't even see what my own, oh, coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, I tend to agree with about 99% of what Alan Auerbach says. Uh, I even ask him to uh, tell me how to vote on the California propositions. There, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a few cases where I disagree with them, and that's on the value of, of government spending multipliers. And so I'm going to talk about that to some extent, but also a little bit about infrastructure and tax multipliers. So my assessment of the US evidence. Now, I think some of this might be applicable to other countries, but I do think that there are several ways that uh, multipliers could be bigger in Europe. And we might talk in the general discussion about that. But for right now, I'm going to focus on the US evidence. Uh, I think that spending stimulus multipliers tend to be below probably less than one in most instances. And I'll, and I'll be a little bit uh, clearer about this in a second. The evidence on infrastructure multipliers at this point, I would say, is mixed. 
But the strongest, most robust evidence is that tax cuts have the biggest multipliers, and I'll elucidate that in a bit. So government spending multipliers, that's where I've spent most of my time doing estimation. All right, on average, if you take aggregate data, you typically will find multipliers below one. Okay. Uh, however, many point to the path-breaking work of Auerbach and Granichenko, who were among the first to look at the idea that multipliers might be higher during recessions or during times of low growth. Okay? And in fact, I'll show you that they found uh, some much higher ones. So let's look a little bit more closely at this. So this is from their original paper for the US post-World War II data. And they calculated the multiplier. This is accumulated over 20 quarters, so over five years. Okay, in their baseline estimates, they found a multiplier of 2.2 during recessions, according to their estimate of recession, and minus 0.3 in expansion, but basically not that different from zero, all right? This has uh, attracted a lot of attention because the whole idea that even if on average government spending multipliers are low, if they're high during a recession, that's just when we need them to be high. So it, it, was, it has a very optimistic message. Now, that was in a simple baseline where they made a lot of assumptions and turned a nonlinear problem into a linear one. And then we have to go into what Olivier calls the dark spaces of nonlinearity, and that's also true for the VARs. So one thing they do is, in that original estimate, they actually assume that government spending can't change the regime, can't get you out of a recession. So there's a little bit of a contradiction there. So then they uh, loosen that restriction, and the multiplier gets a little bit lower, but it's still a very healthy multiplier. However, it turns out that these are very fragile results. Okay, So, so my co-authors and I were trying to understand why we got different results from them. And we found that simple things like not including future growth in your definition of the current state and instead just looking backwards actually sw uh, uh, switched, reversed the multiplier so that they were bigger in expansions than recessions. But standard errors were huge, so, so nobody go out and uh, quote those results. Um, but then something else. In all of the follow-up work, uh, Alan and his co-author, Yuri, switch to using another technique, the Jordan local projections technique, which is a lot more robust than these sometimes knife-edgy kind of uh, nonlinear vector autoregressions. And what we found is when we applied that new technique that they had pioneered for state dependence model to their data for the US, suddenly the multiplier in recession was 0.8, and in expansion was minus 0.6, okay? So, this is a really intriguing idea, but these, in these nonlinear cases, the results can be very fragile. So I have a paper with Sarah Zuberi that's forthcoming in the JPE, where we were trying to look at much longer data in the idea of getting more information going back to 1889. Why look at US historical data? Well, because you got a lot of fluctuation in government spending, particularly around World War II's. You have other periods of zero lower bounds, and you have periods of very high unemployment rates. So we thought that there would be a lot of uh, information in the data. So when we do that, we find that multipliers are below one, even in bad states. And this is robust to bad states, states being defined as having high unemployment, an NBR recession, using our Bakarani Chenko's definition, all of those. So we have a huge online appendix with nothing but multipliers of 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, things like that. Uh, it's also robust to using my preferred military news or to using Blanchard and Parati's identification system. We find that if we use the entire sample, multipliers are below one, even in the zero lower bound, because some people have thought that there's something special about the zero lower bound. But that comes with a caveat. Here, the results are a little bit more fragile. When we excluded World War II rationing, and particularly the end of World War II, we could actually find multipliers that were bigger, 1.5. And I should say that there's some follow-up work using this same uh, sort of technique for, for Japan that's finding multipliers of 1.5 or even higher in Japan's zero lower bound. So there, there's, there is some evidence of perhaps higher multipliers during the zero lower bound, but um, the results in terms of high unemployment states, low growth states is more fragile. Okay, uh, this is just tells you how many 0.6s, 0.7s we got. Um, I should say that when we use the Blanchard and Parati shock, we actually do find higher multipliers in recessions than in, um, actually high unemployment periods than in low, 
but not because the multipliers are so high when unemployment is high, but rather because it's so low when unemployment is low. So yes, the multipliers are higher, but we still find them below one. Um, now, some people have said, you know, it's really hard to, to identify exogenous government spending shocks and aggregate data. And people say, I don't want to see data with World War II. The world has changed. And I think that these are, are valid concerns. So some have said, you know, we can do much better identifying natural experiments and things like that in microdata. And then what we should do is just take those estimates and translate them to the aggregate level. So I want to comment on that. Okay, so as I said, it's a lot easier to actually get estimates of what happens if you increase government spending in one state versus a not, or if you look at, say, marginal propensity to consume on a household level out of, say, a tax rebate. Now, the micro and state level estimates tend to imply much larger multipliers. This is something where you consistently see it across uh, across experiments. And the marginal uh, high multiplier is typically 1.5 to 2. All right, so there's some evidence if you look at the state level. Okay, now some, now the problem is how do you go from the state level or say the individual level to the aggregate level? It's not straightforward, but some have recently, uh, Chad Roy Reich in his recent paper, have used new Keynesian theories to say that actually the state level estimates are lower bound on the aggregate estimate, okay? So that would suggest that the aggregate estimates are even higher. So let's look at that. I'm gonna conduct two plausibility tests, okay? The first is actually Claudia Somm, Matthew Shapiro, and Joel Slemrod's plausibility test of Parker, Jonathan Parker's wonderful microestimates, uh, individual level estimates on the marginal propensities to consume out of the 2008 tax rebate, all right? This is a beautifully done study. There was a basic uh, a natural experiment where things were random in terms of the timing. But then what we're gonna do is take those and apply them to the aggregate level. I'm then going to, inspired by that, do a plausibility test of Chaudhary Reich's contention that his cross-state ARRA estimates are lower bounds on the aggregate effects of the ARRA. All right, so I'm going to apply these estimates to say what, to do a counterfactual. What would have happened to, in one case, unemployment, the other case, motor vehicle sales, had there been no stimulus, if we believe that those microestimates can be applied at the aggregate level? Here's the first one. This is just straight out of a table in Psalm et al. Okay. The green line is actual expenditures on motor vehicles. That's the solid line. The red dotted line is their estimates using Jonathan Parker et al.'s microestimates of marginal propensities to consume, because they found very high ones for motor vehicles. Um, if you believe their estimates, then the red line tells you what should have happened to motor vehicles had there been no 2008 tax rebate. Now, many here were in Washington at that time. I don't think anybody believes that motor vehicles would have collapsed in May, June, and July of 2008 and then uh, been resurrected at the time of the Lehman crisis, okay? so. This is, so that's a plausibility test. If you believe that you can take the micro and put it on the macro, then that's what your counterfactual is. I then did one using the Chaudhary Reich estimates where he looked at the effects of the ARA on his recent synthesis paper. The green is the actual unemployment rate for the US. If we apply his estimates, which are basically $50,000 costs per job year created, and then the counterfactual, if there was no ARRA, would have been that the unemployment rate would have gone to 15%. Okay, so you can judge what the plausibility of that is. And, okay. Infrastructure multipliers. I mean, I believe the evidence that the uh, interstate highway system had really high marginal product and very positive, at least long run multipliers. Uh, the question is, what is the multiplier on the current stock of potential infrastructure projects? I have to say, like Larry, I'm embarrassed every time I come back to the US and have to go through JFK and LAX, particularly coming back from China. So, so I think that there's got to be some marginal product, but for how many projects? Um, this is an understudied area, but one rec useful recent contribution is like Duke and Wilson, who again look on the state level. Now, they always quote, I was a discussant on that paper, it was at the NBR macro annual. They always quote what happens after eight years, all right? 
Let me show you the entire plot. So this is employment, which was estimated more precisely. That if you have an increase in government spending on roads in your state, they say, look, there's a big positive effect at eight years. And in my discussion, I kept saying, well, what about years one, two, three, and four? And in fact, if you look at the integral of that negative effect on employment, I think that could almost be bigger than the positive effect. All right, I have no idea why they're getting this, but um, that's my timer going off. Okay. Sorry, because <laughs> I didn't think you'd help me keep time. Anyway, tax rate changes. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna take one minute. The most robust estimates are actually Romer and Romer's estimates, and they estimate the multiplier on the tax rate changes minus three, all right? And let me say, I went to those data just like I did for Yuri, or for, for Alan and Yuri's data, because I just didn't believe these. I could not knock this down, at least with what I had done so far. Follow-up work by Mervins and, uh, Mertens and Robin finds similarly strong effects with much fancier methods, minus 2.5 to minus 3. They also split the Romer and Romer series into personal income tax changes and corporate. This is in the AER. They find that, on average, corporate tax rate cuts have been revenue neutral. Not true for personal income tax rate, but corporate tax rate. Now, that's on average over the post-World War II period, but that's something to keep in mind uh, going forward. So conclusions, the most robust estimates are the ones are, I should say, the most robust aggregate estimates of spending multipliers are those that lie below unity. Some multiplier estimates are higher, but they tend to be fragile. More work needs to be done on infrastructure multipliers before taking strong stands. And the largest, most robust multiplier estimates are those for tax rate changes. So, you know, we'll see. Many people might look at those differently, but I haven't been able to uh, find smaller ones. Thanks. Bob Rubin. Bob Rubin. That's the whole introduction. <laughs> Let me recite my resume briefly. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Larry. All right, I'm going to do something a little bit different than the erudite presentation you just heard. Microphone. Oh, I'm, oh uh, I don't know what to say. This. Uh, <laughs> Any turn on? Oh. Okay. Well, I was saying. Uh, uh, my views will be, uh, or my yeah, my presentation will be somewhat less, in fact, exceedingly less erudite than what you've just heard, uh, and mine will be in the spirit of Fisher Black who when he came from MIT to Goldman Sachs, after he'd been with us for a while, said that markets looked very different from the banks of the Hudson than they had from the banks of the Charles. That, of course, is a different context, but I think the same principle applies. I'm gonna describe what I think are the five, or at least five, adverse effects of the American unsound fiscal trajectory. And as you know, the CBO projects we will have 150% debt to GDP ratio 30 years. Now you can debate that if you want to, but that's their, that's their projection. And in my judgment, at least all of these effects are significant with respect to growth, and a lot of them are not captured in, in much of what is done by economists. Let me make a first few quick comments before I turn to my five adverse effects. One, I'm putting this in American context, but I think the points apply broadly. Secondly, I'm doing this for a full employment economy, but at the end I'll turn to an economy with, with labor slack. Thirdly, uh, to state the obvious, and Alan says this in his paper, uh, the effects of fiscal policy will be very much affected by the state of the debt GDP ratio or the fiscal condition at the beginning of the period. But on that score, Alan expresses great concern about the fact that we don't have uh, present values for what he calls the implicit liabilities, and he's obviously right in one sense. But on the other hand, I guess I'm a little less worried because they do get captured in the, in the trajectories. Although, as Alan says, uh, those are not uh, ob binding obligations as, as bonds are. And finally, there is enormous uncertainty, at least in my opinion, about any fiscal decisions and what their effects are gonna be. And I at least believe, and, and I think that uh, Olivier and, and, and Larry referred to this in the paper, I believe that uncertainty should itself be a factor in making fiscal decisions. Okay, the five adverse effects are, one, negatively affecting business confidence by creating uncertainty about future policy and by heightening concern about the potential of our government, in this case ours, but I think same true in any developed country, the capacity, the ability, the likelihood of our government meeting our challenges, 
Economists have a difficulty measuring confidence, and as a result, I think tend not to, in business confidence, to include it in their analyses, but doesn't make it any less real. I don't think there is any question, at least in my mind, that the 1993 deficit reduction program was in part successful because, as Larry pointed out this morning, interest rates were high and there was room for interest rates to come down. But I think there was also a very real and serious effect on business confidence. And I can tell you that in the period prior to that, 1991, 1992, when I was dealing with a lot of corporate clients at Goldman Sachs, there is no question that their concerns about our fiscal position were not just a function of the uncertainty about policy, though that certainly was a factor, but also a real concern about whether our government could deal with our problems and that that was having a significant impact on investment decisions. Two, reducing, and I think Alan referred to this, reducing resilience to deal with future economic and geopolitical emergencies. Three, reducing funds available for public investment, uh, either because, well, for both two reasons. One is interest costs are a higher percentage of the budget, wherever rates may be. And secondly, the higher the debt-to-GDP ratio, it seems to me at least, the greater the risks in borrowing for public investment purposes. Four, increasing sovereign and private market interest rates because of increased demand for capital, but also very much because of increased psychological concern about future imbalances, future inflation, and interest rates. Moreover, markets sometimes have tipping points where some relatively minor event that focuses attention on long ignored risks can catalyze a reaction to those risks. And a good example is that if we had an increase, even a small increase from borrowing in debt GDP ratio, I think there's at least the possibility, maybe a real possibility, maybe a significant probability that at some point, whatever that point might be, in a full employment economy, that that would create a step function effect on interest rates, not a linear effect, because it would all of a sudden focus the markets on a risk, the debt to GDP ratio and its trajectory that they had long ignored. And that in turn could affect private sector interest rates, obviously, when the safe rate goes up, and also could widen spreads because of the heightened concern about our fiscal conditions. And this is nice. Oh, one other comment. It seems to me, at least, that it's these market dynamics that are the problem with something that uh, Olivier and, and Larry wrote about in their paper, in which they talk about the potential for the government, as long as uh, R and G have the appropriate relationship, to borrow indefinitely with no cost, and therefore, and, and then redistribute the funds to the public, whatever they wanted to do. And it seems to me the problem with that is that at some point as that goes on, what you could have is the step function, or rather is the recognition in the markets all of a sudden of an unsound fiscal trajectory, because I don't think that R and G would maintain that relationship. I think there'd be a substantial change in the relationship between R and G. And at that point, you could have an interest rate, or you could have a, a bond market ex explosion on the downside and an interest rate on the upside. And in, in a way, uh, Olivier and, and, and Larry refer to that because they do refer to this, this uh, hypothetical of theirs as a Ponzi scheme. So that does suggest that perhaps, or at least it's a possibility of being a Ponzi scheme. Okay. Obviously, if you can borrow in your own currency, and if the central bank is going to print the currency, uh, that may diminish the risk I've just described. But I at least don't think that indefinite levitation through borrowing and printing is a sound place to be. I think it has its limits, and at some point, I think it runs the potential of undermining risk in your currency, of undermining confidence in your currency, and undermining confidence in your markets. Capital inflows can obviously alleviate pressure, but again, you run into the same problem. If you have unsound fiscal conditions, that sooner or later you run the risk that that will undermine confidence in your markets, undermine confidence in your currency, and therefore undermine capital inflows. Extensive liquidity may modulate market pressure. But in my view, and this was something Alan Greenspan used to say somewhat informally, I don't know if he ever said it on the record, liquidity is, is, a, is a funny phenomenon. It's partly a monetary phenomenon, at least in my opinion, partly a psychological phenomenon. Right now we have a lot of liquidity. If all of a sudden confidence greatly diminished, then you could see a rush out of risk assets into treasury bills, and then we would say, We've had a tremendous shrinkage of liquidity, which really happened just as the confidence has changed. Let me also address a, a point that Larry made this morning. He said that uh, our debt is going up, but so is our wealth, and therefore we should take comfort. Exactly the point that Trump made yesterday. I, I don't know if I'm Larry's advice or not. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that shows us 
something about Larry or something about Trump. But anyway, um, I, I will make the observation, if I may, that mar wealth that goes up can also go down. October 16th, 1987 was one day. October 19th, 1987, a weekend later, nothing had happened except the market went down 22%. Wealth, of course, would have gone down 22%. I mean, but debt had stayed the same. Just an observation. Both Mr. Trump and Larry could take <laughs> under advisement. Finally, just to lump two people together who seem to think the same way. Um, <laughs> finally, if fiscal conditions came to be seen as sufficiently serious, I think that the market conditions I've just described can lead to something much beyond what I've just described, but can lead to economic crisis. Moreover, markets can, and you all know this, but markets can long ignore risks, even for years, until all of a sudden they don't. And when they do, the reaction can be savage and it can be sudden. And a, a good example is, is the sovereign debt of, of some of the southern tier countries in the Eurozone. In a long time, they, they traded very low spreads to buns. And I remember traders saying to me, this doesn't make any sense, but this is what it is. It looks like it's going to continue indefinitely. Well, it did continue indefinitely until all of a sudden it didn't. And when it didn't, it was catastrophic. Okay. It follows the cost of funds and borrowing for new project, infrastructure, tax cuts, or whatever else, in a full employment economy. But I think it's also true, actually, in an uh, economy with labor slack, although there you get some Keynesian effects that have to manage, uh, balance against that, is not just the interest cost on the project, but the possible impacts on future borrowing costs of the federal government and therefore the private sector, and all the other possible negatives, confidence, the risk of crisis, uh, reduced funds for public investment, et cetera, that I've just discussed, even though they can't be quantified and therefore it's very difficult to include them in economic analysis. Obviously, if you have an economy that's substantial unemployment, deficit funding can provide a short-term stimulus, and it can also be used in ways to boost productivity. But, but to repeat something I said a moment ago, it seems to me all the negatives I've just described have to be included in your weighing and your balancing. It's just you now have some additional positives. Uh, Larry once made the observation to me, and it seems to me he's correct, that when you have a stimulus, you can also create a positive effect on confidence because you'll have increased demand, and that may affect how business looks at its prospects. Whether any given stimulus is good policy for the short term and the long term, it seems to me, it's just an obvious comment, but it depends on weighing all of these factors. And I think what there is a tendency to do, particularly in times of slack labor markets, is to either disregard or underweight the negatives in trying to reach an expected, an, a sensible expected value judgment. Uh, Allen's paper states that shorter term stimulus should be combined with longer term structural reform. That's certainly true economically and is almost inconceivable politically, at least in the United States, and I would guess more broadly. Along the same line, it seems to me in theory, surpluses should be generated when you have economic conditions that allow for that, and that way you can balance out against the, the, the reductions or the, 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 the worsening of the debt-GDP ratios that occur or may occur during bad times when you stimulus. But the problem is that in the political environment in which we exist, if you have surpluses, the very strong tendency is to either want to spend them or have tax cuts. Thus, I think where we are is that we will simply have a ratcheting up of debt to GDP ratios, o likely, over the cycle. And it seems to me that potential for ratcheting up is a factor that ought to be considered whenever decisions are made about fiscal stimulus, that is to say, deficit-funded fiscal activity, including during a time of slack labor markets. Allen says that support for contractionary fiscal policy in either weak or e crisis economic conditions is diminishing. My view, whatever it may be worth, is that, a judge, that is a judgment that should be made on the facts of any given situation. And what you need to do is weigh and balance, I think Alan may have said this, the economic effects of alternative policy paths. And I believe there are clearly conditions in which contractionary policy in a weak economy may be the best path and in a crisis economy is necessary. I already cited the 1993 deficit reduction program, which worked not only because interest rates had been relatively high, but also, I think, very importantly, because of the effect on confidence. Uh, in response to the Mexican financial crisis, 1995, the Asian financial crisis, 1997-89, it is true that the, the, the fiscal tightening that was put in place was contractionary, but I think it is equally true that without it, had it had an expansionary fiscal policy, the risks were very high that you'd be going into a deep and long recession in both of those areas. My impression is the same is true in the early stages of the Eurozone crisis. 
where it seemed to me at least that one had to reestablish some level of market confidence in order to try to get stability in the credit markets. Then, of course, the question was when we should have, or when somebody should have switched from a more contractionary policy to a more expansionary policy. That, I think, is a different question. Let me conclude with one, just one comment, and that is that I've been around this stuff for a long, long time, as many of you have. And I think advocates of deficit-funded tax cuts, deficit-funded spending, stimulus, always have a lot of reasons why we shouldn't worry about the fiscal dimensions. Some of them are sound, some of them are spurious. I've just tried to outline what I think, at least, are the negative dimensions of deficit-funded spending or tax cuts, which you then have to weigh against whatever you think the positives are with respect to growth. And I think that in most decisions that we make, in our political system at least, those negatives tend to be significantly underweighted. And I think the result is we have an inherent tendency to get a worse and worse fiscal situation over, over, all, over, over the, the, the all cycles. <laughs> and I think in the final analysis, we are likely to pay a very high cost for that. Any event, those are my comments, and you can take them for whatever they may be worth. And I think they're kind of probably worth at least something as one thinks about these things and injects that kind of Fisher Black market realism. I don't know if Fisher would agree with me citing him for that, but in any event, I think he would, <laughs> uh, in, into discussions and analysis of fiscal decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. this stuff for a long time. Thanks, uh, Larry. And so thanks very much to Adam for having us all here, and in particular to Larry and Olivier for asking me to participate. I had a chance, I think, two Rethinking Macros ago to, to participate in one of these, and I think they're great conferences and a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to see if I can get this going in the right direction. No? Ah, great. So um, the th the place I'd like to start here um, is thinking about what we've learned or relearned or, or should take away from the last decade or so. And, and a lot of this came up, especially in the very first session um, with Larry and Olivier's paper. But if we think that we've learned that fiscal policy works near the zero lower bound, and I'm not actually going to debate specific multipliers because I think as long as it, depending how bad things are, as long as they're above, safely above zero, you are, you are in a, a situation where you can actually push economic activity forward, um, it, it's going to depend on the costs. Um, I think we've also learned we may be at the zero lower bound a lot more often uh, than we used to think we were going to be. Um, and I think at least one thing we should take away from the last decade is that one problem we face that I don't think we used to think we faced is that in a bad situation, we often face a serious lack of, of decisions to do to spend. And I think we've often thought that that was never the problem. But it does seem, if you look at a number of countries, that we face situations where it's clear that more deficit spending would have been a good idea and it wasn't done. And I think we should take that seriously, in addition to the notion that some countries pivoted to austerity far too soon. Um, so in that sense, my view of the rethink that we should need to think about is how do we make sure appropriate stimulus policy happens when it should happen? And here I take all of Bob's points on board that you don't want it happening all the time and you don't want it happening without weighing the cost and benefits, but you should take seriously that, that sometimes it's needed. Um, I, take, um, I was listening to an interview with our moderator a couple weeks ago and he was speaking about monetary policy and he said, it does not appear that the problem of a dynamically inconsistent central bank yielding to the temptation to inflate and lacking credibility is really the problem we face. And I think we should think about a similar situation with fiscal policy. Um, with, first, I should say, I don't think the, the analogy holds over entirely in that we should still worry about a present bias-focused fiscal agent acting irresponsibly. I think we can look around the world and see plenty of examples where that's taking place, including possibly in the United States in the next few months. Um, but at the same time, if you just go and go to the NBR working paper sites and look at the very first paper you find on fiscal policy, we'll almost certainly have a quote like this one in the abstract, because I just checked and it does right now, um, which is to say, we study a model in which the government is present biased in terms of public spending. Um, and that I think is a serious concern that fiscal rules should take into account. I just think we should also take into account the other side of the coin, that in some instances, the fiscal agent may be insufficiently present biased 
uh, during a downturn and may not do as much as it should, given what we've learned about fiscal policy at zero lower bound and some of the constraints monetary policy faces at the zero lower bound. And I should say here I'm using zero lower bound as a shorthand for the effective lower bound or some limitations on monetary policy. Um, I think Alan's paper is a great tour through a lot of the things that we should be thinking about right now, rules and fiscal policy to stimulate how low interest rates and fiscal policy interact. Um, but I think his second section there is really important in terms of how fiscal policy can be effective at gener generating economic activity, especially at the zero lower bound. And that seems to suggest that if we are thinking about rules, we really need to make sure those rules aren't constraints on that activity. Um, we may need them for a range of other reasons, but we don't want them to stop um, stimulus when we actually think it is appropriate. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think the other folks have already talked about it. I think there, there's an, a lot of work out there suggesting that stimulus can work. Exactly how much it works I think is very fair to debate. Um, there's also work that even stimulus can lower debt to GDP ratios, including from our moderator. Um, and that contractionary policy can be contractionary. I would agree it doesn't have to be contractionary, but in particular, if the exchange rate and the interest rate can't cushion it, it seems like we've learned it certainly is. And work like Olivier's with Daniel Lay and, and others' studies of your experience, I think, highlights this. Um, and so that the conditions you need that increasing the deficit doesn't lift the interest rate substantially, um, or flip side, that your cuts won't lower it if you're going in the other direction, that there are a lot of underutilized resources, possibly hysteresis, and that solvency isn't massively under challenge, or to some extent, that long-run growth um, isn't just as much a big worry as long-run debt. And I think that's one thing we've seen in this instance is often markets reacted to long-run growth projections just as much as they reacted to long-run spending projections because the debt-to-GDP ratio has a denominator. Um, so I think the second argument I would make is that fiscal policy has, was inad inadequately pro-growth over the last decade or so. Um, I think in the United States, if you look, you see that there was a great deal of pushback on the size of the ARA, including even things like removing effective stimulus and putting in things like the AMT relief at the last minute in ways that reduced the effectiveness of the program. I think you saw big resistance there to more stimulus following on after that, including when infrastructure or new jobs tax credits type bills were proposed over the next couple of years, and that the fiscal cuts, at least in my view, started too early. In Europe, I think you can see very much the same type of problem for a num number of countries being very hesitant to spend or pivoting to austerity very sharply, and that when you looked, you saw in some ways we needed the G20 to encourage everyone to go do some spending and to go do some stimulus, and that was a really important thing when the G20 did that. Um, in April 2009 and got a lot of countries acting forward, um, but very quickly the G20 itself pivoted away from that by June of 2010. Um, if we look, I think you can see um, as the United States is just an example. The, the blue here is what the federal government did. The red is what state and local did. Um, and you see by 2010, uh, the two are balancing out such that the fiscal impetus is basically zero. And after that, the next three years, it's contractionary. Now, the one footnote to that is this is government spending and investment. It doesn't include tax cuts. And certainly in 2011 and 12, uh, there were tax cuts taking place, especially the payroll tax cut that, that would certainly be viewed as, as stimulus. But I think this does show just how quickly we were moving away from stimulus. Um, similarly, the IMF did some work looking across countries, um, and the blue line there is what typically had happened in recessions, and the red line is what happened in this one, and I think you can see in the advanced economies, and then over on the right in the U.S. and in the euro area, um, in the U.S. at least, a larger stimulus right away, but disappearing very quickly, and in the rest, and in Europe, very sharp uh, pivots towards austerity such that this really did look different. We didn't have fiscal policy playing the positive role that we normally saw fiscal policy playing this time around. Um, and another way to look at that is just looking at the change in the structural surplus in all of these countries. This is from 2010 to 2013, and you have a lot of countries with very high unemployment rates making very large um, pivots towards austerity, including Spain cutting its budget deficit by seven percentage points of GDP while the unemployment rate's over 20 percent. Um, I think if we look at policy advice around 2010, um, it was very hawkish. So the, the IMF document to the G20 um, said there's a pressing need in general for fiscal consolidation in the G20 advanced economies. I'm not picking on the IMF and certainly not any 
individuals there, I think there was a range of views, but these were the official pronouncements coming forward, not just the IMF, but from the OECD and from the European Commission, arguing that most member states needed to move heavily in the direction of fiscal consolidation. Interestingly, by 2016, the policy advice had entirely flipped around, despite the fact that the economies were doing much, much better. Um, and suddenly, you had the G20, the IMF, and the OECD all um, focusing on the fact that fiscal policy needed to be playing a growth supportive role um, because monetary policy couldn't do everything by itself. And despite the fact that these economies were in much better shape than in 2010, um, they, were, they were less hawkish. I think the one question is, so it, it seems in some sense there's, there's a, a shift in view. The question is if we were to hit a downturn again, um, where, would, where would pronouncements go and would governments be willing to listen to them? Um, I think the issue of coordination of fiscal and monetary policy winds up being a really interesting one, and a lot's been said about it already, so I won't add, add too much about the, the first point. But I do think another issue that comes up um, in terms of the coordination is the idea that I think we've learned in the last decade or, or last two decades, including Japan's experience, that getting out of a low inflation recession or low inflation slow growth episode is really hard. And very, very, very creative central banks working very hard to get out of that position struggle. And that, that highlights the fact that fiscal policy needs to be helping here. And I think if you read or listened to all of Ben Bernanke's comments every six months to Congress and his Humphrey Hawkins testimony, he was making this very, very clear that he needed some help and he wasn't always getting it. I think if you look at Japan where they establish a new inflation target and are gonna try really hard to convince everyone that this is what it is, and then the fiscal agent turns around and raises consumption taxes almost right away, helping to derail that effort to shift to a higher inflation rate, um, it becomes clear that we need the fiscal agent often to be helping the monetary agent do their work and get off the zero lower bound and, and get back to a more normal economic role. I, I do wonder in some sense if we could just make a new rule that the, the proceeds, not the full amount, but the interest savings from QE automatically get spent. So if the central bank goes and does $2 trillion in QE, there's $50 billion a year that's, that's automatically being spent. Um, just I, not saying anyone would actually do that, but I, these are the kinds of things I think we need to try to make sure that the, the fiscal agent is not counteracting the monetary agent when it's trying to get off the zero lower bound. Um, I'm going to actually skip over this just to conclude. And I, I think then, to sum up, if we're trying to rethink here, I think, again, any fiscal rules that we put in place, we really need to emphasize that they don't interfere with stimulus taking place when it should take place, with an emphasis there. Um, I think um, fiscal policy should happen at the level of the government responsible for the business cycle, and if it's not, we really need to take that into account. And so in the US, and Alan mentioned this, that may mean that we need to have a lot more money going to states to prevent state and local governments from counteracting the, the, the business cycle management that's taking place at the center. And then as Marco pointed out, this is a real problem in Europe because there just really isn't any fiscal policy taking place at the center. Um, leaving everything happening in a decentralized manner. And I actually had, I think, almost the exact same statement he had, which is you run into the problem that those who can spend don't want to and those who want to can't. And then you wind up with real limitations on how much productive fiscal policy can be taking place. I would just want to echo what Olivier opened up with this morning, that I think this calls for a lot more work in, in automatic stabilizers. The one thing I would add is I don't think it just calls for more academic work. I think we know a lot about what to do already, and the policies are out there. I think we need some will to put these things in place. And so I think we know in the United States that there's no reason that in an ad hoc way we extend unemployment insurance um, and we make Congress take a vote every six months. There are unemployment rate triggers in those bills they always pass. We could just make that the permanent policy so they don't have to take the time to go ahead and debate and pass it. You set the unemployment rate triggers tight enough so that it doesn't kick in all the time. Things like that would work. Um, we also know you could expand unemployment insurance in ways like wage insurance. Those things have been in budgets that have been proposed. I think we could do a lot more right now without even having to, to go through the time to work more. And even on infrastructure funds, the, the National Academy of Sciences sponsored a panel, I know because I was on it, where we were asked to think about how, it, how transportation spending could be used towards stimulus. And there were a whole bunch of proposals that were put forth there. So I think there are a lot of things we could put in place now. And there's a little section in Alan's paper I would recommend to you where he just emphasizes, we need to think now about how we're going to do stimulus the next time, because being ready for it is really important. Um, and so that's both on the automatic stabilizers and being ready to do stimulus because 
coming up with new methods on the fly is both inefficient and almost certainly going to have error involved. And knowing what we want to do ex ante, I think, would be really helpful. And there are other papers. There's Alan Binder's Hamilton Project paper. Jason had a speech on this, and I'm wrapping up there. So that I think we just need to be ready to do more. There we go. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of slightly pointed questions and ask people for brief answers. Um, Jay answered the first. Jay answered what was going to be my first question, which was you all said a lot about a lot of very interesting things you think. The conference is called Rethinking Macro. What important thing do you think differently because we had a financial crisis over the last 10 years? and the world had the outcomes that it did in response to the financial crisis? Or do you sort of have a worldview that you think is right and that you continue to have, that you probably had when you thought about it 10 years ago and that you continue to have today? Jay, had an, Jay gave an answer uh, to that uh, question, but starting with Alan, let me just go down the panel. Just say one thing where you sort of change, where you, the financial crisis well, I, I just become much more confident in our ability to use discretionary fiscal policy to combat deep, long recessions. Okay, so you read the evidence as you're more sure that there are relatively high and predictable multipliers in recession conditions. Well, nothing's predictable, but high, yeah. Higher, uh, higher, yes. Okay. Yes. Mario? Um, Yes, I think what uh, what uh, has changed, at least if I take a euro area perspective, is in the relation between uh, uh, the periphery and the center. Um, I do not think, as I uh, indicated before, that we can achieve in the case of large negative shock a, um, the appropriate fiscal stance at the euro area level simply by adding up what uh, um, Euro area members are, are uh, supposed or willing to do, so we would need a central instrument in order to supplement that. Valerie? I think the most important thing I learned is uh, it's what you don't know that will get you. Um, we started seeing evidence of declining housing prices in California much earlier than the rest of the country. And I remember thinking, this looks bad, but I had no idea what was going on with the credit default swaps, all those sorts of things. And I went out on a limb. I said, I think housing prices could go down 10%. And I remember at our business roundtable, uh, some of the business people talking about ninja loans and those sorts of things. And I had no idea how important those were to the economy. So I think that the importance of good financial regulation that's not overly burdensome is probably the most important macro policy. I, that wasn't about fiscal policy, but I didn't insist uh I would have said the same. Uh, that wasn't about fiscal policy, but I didn't insist you as I didn't frame the question sharply enough to make you talk about fiscal policy, but I've learned from this, so I will for Bob. Bob, what have you changed your <laughs> – what about fiscal policy have you changed your mind about? Well, first of all, I don't agree with you and Mr. Trump on the point you made this morning. But no, no, but <laughs> I think you made that clear. I did make it. Okay. Well, I just want to say it again. Um, uh, I guess what strikes me, Larry, is that the, 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 the crisis and the, the, the Great Recession, the Eurozone crisis, and it's sort of everything I've lived through in my lifetime, markets go to excesses and they go to very substantial excesses. And I think that needs to be very much in the minds of policymakers as they make the decisions, and I think people tend to underweight that and not recognize it. Okay. Uh, this question is probably more for uh, Valerie, Valerie and Bob, but anybody can comment on it. In, in slightly differing degrees, you think fiscal policy doesn't stimulate the economy that much, and while not stimulating the economy, that's what Valerie thinks, the multiplier's lower, and Bob thinks that it has a variety of uh, 
toxic uh, consequences uh, down the road. And Valerie and probably everybody else thinks that there needs to be a bunch more regulation to stop there be a lot of imprudent lending. And that seems like a good idea because it'll reduce bad spending and bubbles. So that seems like a good idea. And gosh, there's kind of a sense that we can't lower interest rates below zero. And if you do too much imprudent financial, uh, if you do too much imprudent financial stuff, bad things will happen uh, because of that. Are you at all worried that if you do all the good and prudent, all the good and prudent things, you'll have done all the right things to avoid accidents, but the totality of that will be an accident because there won't be enough uh, demand in the economy, or are you just kind of confident that somehow there will be enough demand, and so you discount that worry, and if so, why? All right. I think that, so first of all, government spending multipliers are positive. So I do think, for example, World War II got us out of the Great Depression, not because multipliers were so great, but because spending was so great. So, so to be clear there. Um, I think the problem now is less uh, aggregate demand, but aggregate supply. I think there are all kinds of structural issues. I think that decades of bad schools has left us with people who cannot make high wages, and therefore they're, they've withdrawn from the labor market because their families are willing to support them. And so I, I see it as an aggregate supply issue, and I think that part of the financial crisis was people started seeing this low growth period. We had a boom during the 1990s, but that was because of um, all of the innovations in computer, but they've played out, and we don't see anything around the corner right now. That doesn't mean that something can't come. I'm not as pessimistic as Robert Gordon, but I think it's an issue of aggregate supply more than aggregate demand. Bob, if we, if, Bob, if we had put you on, if you had been on a monetary policy panel, you would have been equally eloquent and worried about bubbles and overly loose monetary policy and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, I had those discussions. And you would have talked to and you would have and you would have brought your many years of experience in markets to bear to counsel great alarm about excessively easy monetary policies. Oh, great um, alarm, I don't know, but at least a caution, yeah. Caution, right. So <laughs> if we just kind of ran the world in general according to you, we would have tighter fiscal policy at most moments, and tighter monetary policy at most moments, and more constrained lending policies at most moments, would, do you think it would all sort of work out, or do you think it would be well, some problem? <laughs> <laughs> with, with all due respect to the way you frame that, uh, outrageous way you framed the question, <laughs> uh, no, if you ran the, the, the world the way I would, I would do what Valerie said. Yeah, I would have more. I, ben, when you did QE2, and I was down in the Bahamas bone fishing, and I thought it was a terrible idea, and Larry called me and he said, why do you think it's a terrible idea? I said, for all kinds of reasons, which I, we then discussed. Right? And I, I think I was right. I think you were wrong. But in any event, uh, but you, or you think you're right, and you know a lot more than I do, so perhaps you, perhaps you are right. Um, anyway, be that as it may. No, I think, Larry, I would, have, I would have the kind of things. QE1, I think, was immensely courageous and imperative, and you know, I'd try to make judgments based on the facts of the case. But I'm, I'm where Valerie is. I think that's not where our problem lies. I think we should, you know, reasonably, we should balance judgments about monetary and fiscal policy. I think you could do a lot on the demand side, I really do, if we had the kind of structural changes, because I think that would create not only greater capacity and supply, but I think it could have a real effect on, on, on confidence, and, and confidence generates demand. So your, your, so your theory is that if we did better on if we did better on education and we did better on avoiding populist rhetoric, then we would have confidence and it would all sort of work. Well, not just education, but a, a vast panoply. I wrote had an op-ed in the Washington Post about a year ago, which I, I'm not saying you should agree with my specifics, but I'm, a whole bunch of my, what I specifically would do. Yeah, I do think so. I don't know if it all work out, but I think that would give us our best shot. Okay, let's. Let's turn to what? Let's turn to the let's turn to the audience. Jason. 
I had a um, question for anyone who wants to answer it, but certainly anyone who's responsible for administering fiscal rules would love to hear what you have to think. Um, Alan described the debt basically as the tip of the iceberg, but most of what we have is the future liabilities. Should fiscal rules like um, the Stability and Growth Pact take into account those future liabilities? In particular, should you get credit if you take a step now that reduces those future liabilities that would allow you to run deficits you know, in excess of 3% of GDP or higher debt because you reduced um, the present value. Are we, we think, okay. Um, yes, we are trying to um, factor this into the, uh, into the fiscal framework. What is difficult to do uh, is to do that in a, a um, let's see, mechanical and uh, quantitative precise uh, way given the wild uh, 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 you know, differences in estimates. So we take that into account. Actually, um, Alan, his paper uh, mentions our uh, agent report, which is uh, on the advisory, uh, advisory side. And where uh, uh, we can quantify more, which is on the, uh, on the pension reform, actually we factor it in directly into the, um, into the assessment of the, uh, of the deficit. The difficulty has been how to bring it in in a way that is, uh, let's say, constraining, given the fact that uh, you know, implicit liabilities uh, uh, are not the same as the explicit ones. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, th I tried to, to touch on this in my paper. I, I think on the one hand, you, want to, you definitely want to take them into, the account, into account for the very reason you said, that you want to encourage governments to, uh, to in, uh, adopt forward-looking reforms. But I think for the reasons Marco just said, it's, it's really a futile effort to incorporate them in rules. And I think ultimately this is going to lead to an evolution where we stop pretending that the rules work to a to basically a, a framework, an information advisory, sh you can call it shaming, you can call it anything you want, framework where there are institutions that make it uncomfortable for governments to behave irresponsibly in a way that everybody knows they're doing, but it is increasingly difficult to incorporate in a rule. I'll just can't resist adding. There are a lot of people who, not a lot of people, but a reasonable number of people who've gotten very rich buying office buildings and leasing them back to governments that have a desire to flatter their budget targets because taking on an obligation to pay rent in the future does not, consti does not constitute uh, debt. On the other hand, if you really take the concept of contingent liability seriously, I suspect the uh, national security developments of the last six months have created a contingent liability for the United States government that valued in present value over the next generation is very large and that there have been other moments when the security situation has improved uh, very substantially. So I think it's a very complicated question where there isn't a good answer. Uh, because you can't really take account of, of all of it. And if you take account of only the narrow thing, there are a lot of kinds of abuse. One small clarification. I was referring to if you took an explicit policy step like a pension reform, getting credit for that, which is a little bit easier to assess than Right. If you get credit for it, right, if you get credit for it, but then if you don't do it, what's going to happen? And what do you do with respect to the kind of change in the trend of health care costs that we've had? Some people think that's due to policy. Some people think some people think it's permanent and due to policy. Some people think it's temporary and not anything. Some people think it's permanent but not due to policy. It's, it's pretty hard to do. Someone else. Yes. Um, so, if going back to what Oliver did in the beginning, he tried to characterize how we have come out of the crisis. And if you do that broadly, you could say that countries like the Anglo-Saxon, uh, the Nordic, uh, maybe Germany has, has actually weathered the crisis reasonably well with back to low unemployment and decent growth numbers. While others such as Japan, uh, Latin America, and, and, and maybe continental Europe has not 
uh, weather the crisis as well, with much higher unemployment and, and lower growth and, and probably also more distributive uh, problems. If you then ask what is the distinguishing features between these groups, I, I would argue that the ones that have weathered the crisis better are the ones that are uh, more flexible labor markets, uh, better functioning product markets, uh, better functioning education systems. So fundamentally the ones that has weathered the crisis are the ones where with less structural problems. And I, I think a big problem with this discussion is that um, uh, echoing the critique that, that uh, Oliver had against our macroeconomic models in the beginning as a finance minister when, when you did these programs you basically had no way of distinguishing between structurally correct measures and just uh, temporary stimulus measures because the models doesn't give us any way of, of, of the discriminating between what is good in the long run and what is only demand stimulus. So uh, I think there is a, a, a fundamental problem with conducting fiscal policy today because it's not only the multipliers we don't know, we know very little about the long-term structural effects of, of the policies. But uh, I think we, we probably, I would probably end up saying that it's, it's the structure that is most important. Thank you. Olivier. Going, going back to the discussion of uh, implicit liabilities, the importance of RNG and so on, what I found at the fund was that it was what was extremely useful as a tool was stochastic DSAs, debt sustainability analyses, in which all these factors in principle can be taken into account. It's never perfect, but you know the, ty the type of trick that you mentioned would be detected by a DSA. Uh, implicit liabilities would eventually show up. If R is less than G, then the dynamics are things equal, would be more uh, favorable. And you can look at you know the distribution of that, and you can have a sense of how big the upper tail is. And that's a tool which I think is totally underused. It can be used as a diagnostic tool. It can be used as more. But I really think that there is something to be done here. I I com completely agree with you. And I, and you know that you know looking at, looking at overall uh, looking over distribution is is essentially taking risk into account. Uh, we have a problem with. Uh, rules in general, and this is true whether we're talking about uh, budget rules or anything else, uh, that we govern governments tend to run on point estimates. And uh, it's uh, I, a variety of people, Chuck Mansky's been write, written several papers on this, have been trying to, to uh, come up with uh, alternative ways of judging uh, uh, sort of fiscal responsibility or and you can call it a stress test or anything else uh, it I think I, I think it's it would be very much a step in the right direction as with rules uh, in general I think that, that one there's no way one can conceive of a rule writing a rule that would would incorporate this kind of information but this is precisely the kind of thing that an independent fiscal entity uh, in the US or elsewhere uh, would would be charged with doing uh, that you know basically not just taking you know a single trajectory and saying this is what we look we, we, we look like but this this is sort of what what the possible outcomes are here's the you know bottom here's the, the worst 20 percent of the distribution that's what it looks like these these are the kind of things that I think would be you know much better uh, uh, done in a, in a flexible framework uh, that doesn't uh, simply respond to whether a rule is being satisfied or not. Can I, uh, just no, on this point, uh, just what I know, I agree with uh, Alan on this point. Uh, I mean, basically, I think n not uh, possible to incorporate all this uh, in a precise rule. I think if you move, uh, as I was suggesting at the end, in a m better articulation between rules, institutions, and market discipline, this, I think, pertains to the supply of information which would make the markets, uh, let's say, uh, operating in a more gradual way rather than uh, operating accord horizontal, according to horizontal and vertical lines that we have seen uh, during the crisis, moving from complete neglect to uh, overreaction. So that is, uh, but it, b it belongs to that kind of, uh, uh, you know, tools rather than uh, um, uh, pr being incorporated into a precise rule. I will record, and I, while Bob and I have disagreed on some things, I have a suspicion he might agree with this, uh, that the 
political process is likely to have very substantial difficulty absorbing the results of stochastic stimulation analysis. And if it, making it dynamic is unlikely to fix the problem, <laughs> is unlikely to fix the problem, and that the history of relatively academic models perform dynamically, stochastically, is probably such as to be somewhat justifying of the political process's uh, skepticism. So I would record some reservation about this particular um, line of thought. Yeah, no, but, but we're not talking here about any kind of rule-based penalty or saying you know, you're out of, you know, you're, you're in violation of this particular iteration of the Budget Enforcement Act because uh, you know, the expected utility is negative. Um, it's, it's basically, as with a stress test, it's saying, you know, we're going to look at, uh, uh, you, you know, you don't have to make it stochastic. You can just say we're going to uh, consider a scenario the way the Social Security trustees do, you know, low, medium, and high forecasts. We're, we're going to look at a situation where bad things happen. And here's what happens to the debt-to-GDP ratio. Here's what happens to debt service. Here's the fraction of the budget going for uh, debt service. Uh, you know, at, here's... The tax, how much tax rates would have to go up to, you know, meet a certain deficit target. It can be put in terms where you know um, you you don't have to, you know, worry about kurtosis and things like that. I can't resist telling a story. Um, when I was in the Clinton administration, and I think the same is true in, in the Obama administration, there would be. 10-year budget forecasts, and the OMB would come in and they would have their main scenario, and because they had absorbed this lesson, they would have their disaster scenario and they would have their good scenario. And in their good scenario, the budget deficit would be 1.5% better after eight years than in their bad scenario. And in their bad scenario, it would be 1.5% worse. And I would point out that the history was that the average error in these things wasn't 1.5%, it was about 7%, and they might want to consider a wider band. <laughs> and I would be told that I was only the Treasury Secretary and that gauging uncertainty was the responsibility of a certain group of people who were the gauging uncertainty people, and we were going to continue to do it in the way we had done it. And after two or three times, I stopped um, making this point. But I think it's difficult for these things to be done well. Yes. If we're taking uh, seriously what was said this morning, what was said in part in this panel, that uh, we'll have to rely much more frequently on fiscal policy, does it imply finding a way to depoliticize fiscal policy and to uh, make sure that it does not involve the type of choices that are um, implied by any tax cut or even any, any spending increase to make it much, more, much closer to monetary policy in terms of this distributional effect and in terms of uh, the, the ability to react quickly? It seems to me that one of the few experiences we can draw on in this respect is perhaps the experience of countries like Chile or Norway, uh, we, which uh, are subject to wide cycles, wide uh, cycle driven by commodity prices that have given so to how to manage their, their fiscal policy in this context. Permit me, permit me another story. Uh, I sympathize with your impulse. And when I was involved in the design of the Recovery Act early on um, during the transition, my idea was to try to make it be relatively uncontroversial things that were just going to work as macroeconomic uh, stimulus. And somebody very senior and much closer to the president than I took me aside one day and he said, Larry, I'm just to kind of help you think about this. Um, our party's been out of office and our party likes to do progressive things that advance the public sector and we haven't gotten our way for more than a decade. And now there's an opportunity to spend 
$800 billion to a $1 trillion. Those are once every two decade events. And your idea is that we should ignore all of our party's priorities in the theory of doing it scientifically. I just have a feeling doing it that way is probably not going to get the end within the administration. And so I, I, I take the point, but I think it's going to be very difficult when for democratic administrations when there's an occasion for a major infusion of spending not to pay attention to democratic priorities and for Republican administrations not to pay attention to, uh, Repub to uh, Republican priorities. It's, gonna be, it's just going to be uh, quite difficult. Maybe there's some things you can do in the automatic stabilizer area that somebody, uh, of the kind that were talked about earlier, but I think it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, well, I, I am sympathetic to what Larry just said. I, in a constructive vein, um, <laughs> let, let, me, um, let me suggest that uh, th I think this is really consistent with what I was saying before. And I said one shouldn't get too excited about trying to draw a parallel between independent ce central banks and, and independent fiscal authorities. I don't think... Their fiscal authorities can they, you, you can't give authority to make fiscal decisions to independent entities. I think ultimately the best you can do is to have uh, a, a, a the an independent entity that is out there evaluating different alternatives and saying, here is a list of potential components of a, of a stimulus package. Here here are are existing estimates of either multipliers or cost-benefit calculations uh, showing that some things are just clearly inferior to others in all dimensions, which is undoubtedly true when, when, uh, when things are put in for narrow political, to achieve narrow political objectives. That's not necessarily going to keep them from happening, but it'll be out there that these are bad choices uh, uh, for, for the economy. I don't think you can do more than that. I, I don't think there's any way of constraining uh, the way governments make decisions uh, about fiscal policy beyond simply shedding light on what they're doing. Let me take, uh, let me get two more questions and then give everyone a chance to respond. Yes. Maybe this is a better question for the financial stability panel, but since Bob brought up markets, I was just curious. So what the first, thus far in the day, we've heard monetary policy may be more constrained um, and fiscal policy is the game in town, but political will is going to be an issue because we don't have the ability for automatic stabilizers to step in. So from a market standpoint, that would imply greater volatility, if we were to believe that, and deeper drawdowns because the history of crisis tell you, right, the buyer of last resort and the lender of last resort. So I'm just curious, how would you all think about this from the market standpoint to say that would, would this be the right way to think about it, which is we should then expect deeper drawdowns and shallower recoveries because there will be greater volatility in getting the fiscal policy to step up? Let's take one other question, if there is one. Greg. It's actually kind of related to that last question. So in the spirit of the rethinking macro theme, um, the presumption of the panels, this panel and the morning panel, is uh, we still need stabilization policy as much as we ever did, but we don't have the tools because we're in a low interest rate, low inflation world. So I'd like to actually challenge the premise, do we need stabilization policy as much as we did? Because the presumption is, well, well in the past, we needed to lower the, the funds rate five percentage points, but what if the factors that are um, leading to low equilibrium rates are also leading to a lower amplitude of the business cycle? What if business recessions will be less deep in the future? It's just a conjecture, but I can think of off the, off the top of my head two reasons why that might be. If we're in a permanently like disinflationary world, we will probably have fewer monetary overshoots and therefore fewer policy mistakes that lead to recessions. 
Secondly, one of the factors behind secular stagnation is demographics, aging, lower investment, lower residential investment. Those typically are the most volatile components of GDP. So I can imagine that in a secular stagnation world, the amplitude of the business cycle will be lower and the need for a stabilization policy, therefore, also less important. And maybe we're all worrying about the wrong thing. So I just put that out there. Let me, uh, I, I don't have an answer to the, the first, oh, sorry. Why don't we let the discussants oh, respond and then let you respond. Yeah, sure. To those two things or anything yeah. else you want to say? Sure. So just on, on those last two things, I think um, in, in both cases, I think this is the reason, and this really actually goes to the, the three back as well. Um, I, I completely agree with Alan that you can't depoliticize the fiscal policy process at all for some of the reasons he listed as well as the ones Larry listed. But I do think this is why having some more automatic portion um, take place is useful. And I think this does come back to then the question of, you know, are you saying we're not going to have appropriate fiscal policy? I don't think there's any reason we can't have it. I think we, we saw it at times and have seen it in certain countries. Um, and I think making more of it automatic also, at least hopefully, uh, deals with some of the biases that Bob is worried about, that, that you say, you know, we, act, we actually can tell fairly well if you're headed into a recession. You know, when the unemployment rate goes up a certain amount, you generally are in a recession in the United States, and you can tie certain spending things to it. That's probably not sufficient, and you wouldn't want that to be the whole budget. Um, but I think it's one of the types of things you could do that would, in some sense, depoliticize and also deal with these things. And for that matter, if Greg is right, and the, the uh, recessions are shallower or don't really show up as much, then these things just wouldn't kick in, right? And so you wouldn't be going and doing foolhardy fiscal stimulus policies because the business cycle would be smoother and you just wouldn't ever hit these triggers and so it wouldn't show up that way. Um, but I do think broadly the concerns raised in the very early morning that monetary policy at times may run into some issues unless Ben fixes everything for us with his proposal um, means that we need to be ready and think of ways that get us to, to use stimulus when it's appropriate um, and at the same time draw lines around it so that we don't use it when it's not appropriate and leave ourselves in a position where we don't really have the fiscal space to use it. Bob? Yeah, I guess I have three comments. One. We've had a long, calm period now in markets, equity markets at least, have reflected that. And when that happens, people tend to get the kind of comments, Greg, that you made. I remember Pat Moynihan saying to me once that we've learned how to deal with business cycles, so we're not going to have to deal with at least large business cycles anymore. Well, that turned out to be not correct. Uh, and I think when you get into situations like we've been in over now some, quite some number of years, when you've had, at least in the United States, and, and now the Eurozone coming back, at least as a blip, who knows if it's long stand, long run. Long standing, but who knows? We'll see. I think that's when people start to sound like you sounded, Greg, and I think that's when the dangers become greater, not less. Uh, secondly, in terms of what happens when we have the next recession, well, if we get the tax cut that's been proposed, and you look at what that does to the debt GDP ratio, not only is uh, our interest rates very low, which obviously makes for the difficulty we've all discussed about monetary policy, but once the debt GDP ratio is 95% or 100% or whatever, what does that do to our fiscal resilience? So I guess those would be my two comments. Yeah, that would be my two comments, Larry. Oh, 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 what are the risks? Are there? I think there are a whole bunch of risks we haven't talked about. For example, geopolitics. And, and well, John Whitehead, when he was a senior partner at Goldman Sachs, once said, and I think he was right, we all talk about what the, the risk that can, can set off the next uh, gyration downward, but it's almost always a risk that we haven't thought about. It's not the risk we've had in the past materializing, but it's something new. Um, I agree that there could still be many risks, but I think that there is an argument for this sort of slowly grinding along at a low growth rate. Um, if you think about the sorts of things that we think put the U.S. economy into recession in the past, I mean, so the financial crisis, I think we're all rather chastened right now and trying to avoid that. There were also oil shocks, but those aren't a problem anymore because the U.S. is doesn't import as much oil because of the fracking revolution. Um, there were always the issues of, you know, the Federal Reserve trying to get inflation out of the economy. That's not an issue right now. Now, there are uh, military risks, but those tend to make the economy go up. Um, so those sorts of risks 
are okay. I think the biggest risk is bad government policy and the sorts of things that Alan was talking about it and, and putting together with what Bob was saying is that people don't pay attention to things until suddenly they pay attention to things. And once the public wakes up to all the unfunded liabilities, which most are not aware of, that could potentially be a big risk. And um, it's not clear that extra government s spending for stimulus is going to obviate that risk. Yes, um, no, trying to go back and put together um, uh, Jason, uh, Jean, uh, I think we have to move towards a more Augustinian view of fiscal policy. So I think having more room for maneuver in the short term uh, based uh, on the, the longer term uh, uh, soundness. Uh, uh, so with uh, keeping debt uh, and implicit liabilities under control, so gaining room for maneuver in the short term. Um, second point, I think, uh, work on automatic stabilizers. Um, uh, I think we have to make the, uh, let's say, the, the uh, gradient uh, more steep uh, to, to have more out of uh, uh, the working of automatic stabilizers. I think uh, on that count, uh, we can also help uh, on uh, the, uh, you know, uh, concerns about distribution, uh, uh, redistribution and fend off uh, you see, you know, populist claims. Uh, so if I let me, I mean, I made a jump uh, to uh, to the politics, uh, but I think that there is a way to do that. And finally, on the point of uh, depolitization, I fully agree with uh, Alan here. If I look at Europe, nonetheless, uh, I think if we would put in place uh, a central fiscal capacity um, to help in the case of large shocks, uh, I think that will have to be depoliticized and. Uh, left uh, to an objective uh, uh, triggering mechanism uh, which would be out as automatic as possible. I, I, guess, I guess my summary view would be, I think the economy is almost certainly more brittle because of the lack of capacity of monetary policy to respond and the various problems with fiscal policy that we've been talking about. I don't know what I don't know what I don't know what's right on shocks. They're the points you the, they're the points you make. It's also true that it's a shorter fall from two percent growth into recession than it is from four than it is from three and a half percent growth we used to have uh, into recession, and that we tend not to know why the recessions are uh, going to uh, going to come. I think if you look at the U.S. experience, you'd probably kind of say that over time, downturns have gotten a bit less frequent, but no less severe, would be the way you'd read the evidence. But there isn't enough evidence uh, to have any very confident uh, basis. Thanks. Well, I, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody on the panel for their uh, comments both on my paper and, and otherwise. Um, Greg, I guess a quick response to your question is that uh, the two, 10 years, things weren't that different 10 years ago than they are now. I mean, the population aging, other things, they're, they've sort of been going on for a long time. And that recession was not caused by monetary overshooting. Um, and so I, I think we're, we're at the same risk, you know, of course there's been changes in financial regulation and so forth, but I, I think we're facing similar risks of, of a deep recession now that, that we faced then, and who knows what will set it off the next time. I worry, I, I do worry very much about our fiscal, the fiscal capacity to deal with the next recession, uh, particularly if we have a, a, a big deficit increasing uh, tax cut. And also because of the geopolitical situation. This is one that we were afflicted by in the US, but also in many European countries. And if you think about sort of productive and, and, and unproductive responses, fiscal responses, um, you know, we could have uh, rel reliance on protectionism rather than on domestic stimulus, for example, be preferred uh, as a result of the change in the political climate. So I, I'm quite concerned, and I, I think that a lot of the reform measures, whether it be automatic stabilizers or uh, more fiscal monitoring, uh, which might happen, um, are, you know, are likely also to take uh, a long time to, to, uh, to reach fruition and quite likely will, uh, uh, will not occur before our next recession. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you.
We are going to take a 15-minute coffee break, and at 3.45 sharp, we will start the session on financial stability with a lead-off paper by Andy Haldane.